Hey everybody, Robert Russell here with Ask Robert J. Russell. Today, my special guest is Ian Westerman. Ian, uh, tell me, how you doing today? I'm doing great, Rob. Uh, just another day at the office. Uh, just got done doing a, a live stream to one of my members' areas, and maybe later today I'll, I'll hit a couple balls. So uh, I'm living the dream. Right. And what state are you in? Wisconsin. 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 You got to say it right. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yep. So uh, the setup that you have on your YouTube videos, these are in, this is an indoor court. Um, it's only one indoor court. Now, is this a, a designated tennis facility or did you convert a building with an indoor court in it? How did you do this? It was a, an eight court tennis club that was built back in the 60s here in the Milwaukee area. And it went out of business about three years ago, which has happened to sadly a bunch of indoor, indoor tennis clubs are just becoming more and more difficult to stay viable, at least here in the Wisconsin area. And so went out of business, was purchased by a storage company and I approached the new ownership and I asked if I could lease a, a court and a half of space to do my coaching, my content. And so I've been here for, for about three years. And you have a huge following on YouTube with your tennis videos. Um, I especially like the ones where you show um, like the four or five against a D1 player and, and then talk about that and then y'all laugh. And it's, it's really cool to watch that. So how Thanks. many followers do you have on YouTube right now? We're just a, a couple of days away from, uh, from 250,000 uh, subscribers on YouTube. And uh, yeah, those videos have been a ton of fun to make. I've, I've transitioned into more kind of real life type content in the last year since the, the pandemic, pandemic. And I've, I've just been on the court coaching less. So I kind of took the plunge and started training myself again as a player, started playing more matches. So that type of content has been a lot of fun to, to focus on. And so um, how old are you, Ian? Just turned 40. Woo, you're old. I remember when I was 40. <laughs> um, so how old were you when you started playing tennis? I started when I was 11, which relative to somebody who made a career out of, out of tennis is relatively late, but I think it was a perfect age for me because I didn't grow up in a tennis family. So I wasn't really, I wasn't pushed. I didn't have any, any pressure or outside influence at all to, to play tennis. And so I really just gravitated towards it. I think it was perfect fit for my, my personality and just had more and more of a passion for it. As I played more, I took more lessons, started competing. And I decided when I was probably 14 or 15 that I just couldn't imagine a better job than being on a tennis court all day, every day. Right. And so by the time I graduated high school, that was my goal in life was to figure out how I could somehow get paid. I, I knew by the end of co uh, high school that being a professional player was not in the cards for me. And, and so I figured out, I had to figure out some other way of being paid to be on a court. And so becoming a coach was the next most logical solution for me. That's awesome. I played, um, I started playing when I was 10 in our driveway. Um, yeah. so I've been playing a long time. Of course, I took off for 20 years going through a marriage and all that stuff and, you know, being the taxi cab driver for the kids. Um, yep. So for me recently, I just got back into it about five years ago. And it, dude, laying off 20 years is a big transition. Um, I was watching a video the other day where they were showing a video of how the players used to hit the ball like McEnroe and Bork, how they just kind of pushed the ball. And now it's a, uh, it's a complete different game. And that's what I'm trying to learn now. Mm. So let's go to uh, the style of tennis. Uh, what have you seen since you've been playing on how tennis has changed since you started? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say I started learning in the early nineties. And so at that point in time, things were just starting to transition in a meaningful way towards the more modern. And, and so I kind of had a foot in each camp. I, I was very fortunate to have an amazing coach who 
he himself, when I started t t taking lessons from him, he was probably in his mid to late forties, maybe early forties. So he had very much grown up in that old era of a much more linear game, uh, turn to the side, racket back, and then, you know, point the racket towards the target, you know, kind of old school coaching. Mm -hmm. And so that was what he grew up in. But I was, I was so lucky that he was the one I started taking lessons with because he had a massive passion for the game and for coaching and for self-improvement and self-development. So he was not staying stuck in the old ways. And in the early 90s, things weren't nearly as aggressive or athletic or powerful or as spinny as it is now at the top levels of the game. But things were starting to move in that direction. And so um, I was exposed to a lot of the, I, I was kind of just old enough. I'm just old enough that when I was starting to learn, I got exposed to some of those old school methodologies, uh, but young enough that I've basically seen, you know, most of that big transition over the nineties, uh, early two thousands uh, from like the old school Agassi. I really can't even call it Agassi like old school. Obviously he was hitting the ball huge. Um, and so I, I would say more so as who would, who would have been like, I guess a courier was in the same, uh, era as Agassi, I guess Connors kind of had a foot right in each of those camps. Like he came from the old school and transitioned towards the new school. Uh, and then it went towards more of the Agassi and, uh, baseline, you know, kind of tennis, more athleticism, more use of the body, uh, as opposed to just kind of consistency and constructing points in a more, thoughtful way as opposed to being able to just overpower somebody so that in a nutshell I would say has been the transition from a very linear control and uh, kind of positional kind of chess kind of mindset to a very uh, circular and dynamic and athletic creating way more racket head speed way more power way more spin and now to be able to survive at a high level you need really major significant weapons which right. is a total change from 30, 40 years ago. Right. Just the rackets. Remember when the rackets were wooden rackets and they were like yeah. very small heads. And now they're, you get yep. the oversized rackets. So yeah, every that's day I've been, been a part of it. Every day I've been posting in your group a, a question, tennis question of the day. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Uh, but today's question was if you could pick any pro and, um, and, and have his, um, his ability, what ability would it be? And so people are posting Federer's backhand and Stan's backhand and different stuff like that. So I'm going to go through different um, uh, plays of the game and I want you to name, we're going to do this pretty quick. I want you to tell me what pros you would like to have their game of different things. Okay, you ready? Let's do it. Serve. Sampras. Sampras. Uh, overheads. Uh, Sampras. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What about jumping on your overhead? Yeah, Sampras. <laughs> yeah. Not Maltese? Uh, in my, uh, for me growing up, there was this poster, this Nike poster of uh, Sampras. And he was like, he was kind of known for like the slam dunk uh, overhead. Right. And uh, early 2000s when I was in college, like every tennis player had that Sampras poster uh, in, in their room. So I got I to gotta stick with. Monfils is ridiculous. I would take any shot from Monfils. Such a ridiculous athlete. Right. Um, but I got to like my uh, nostalgia says uh, Sampras. <laughs> All right. What about uh, forehand? Yeah, I got to go Roger there. Roger? Yeah. Um, top spin forehand. I mean, R Rafa. So, Rafa, okay. Yeah. Backhand. Um, Kirton. I'll, I'll go uh, Gustavo uh, Kirton. <laughs> All right, let me see. What am I forgetting? Um, what am I forgetting? Oh, I don't know. Volleys, uh, slice backhand. Volleys, yeah, yeah, volleys, volleys. What about volleys? Um... I got to, I probably need to pick somebody. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm going to go McEnroe. Like, uh, although like aesthetically, I prefer somebody a little more conventional than McEnroe, but I'm left-handed and uh, uh, just love his uh, fight and his athleticism and his ability to just kind of make stuff up. Uh, what about Pat Rafter? Style. 
Pat oh, Rash. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I can name 100 players I would gladly trade volleys with. All right, so if you could pick the ultimate doubles team to play against, against pro players, who would the two pro players be? I feel like I got to go like old school. If I could pick any two players, it'd be like Rod Laver and like uh, Ken Rosewall or something like that. Whoa. Um, just for like the history and, and also just to go back to that style. Uh, it'd be a lot of fun to see that across the net for me. So yeah, I'll go Laver and Rosewall. Awesome. When you uh, get a chance to look at your group, look at the answers that we're getting on this. Yeah, I bet, bet there's some good ones. It's crazy. All right, so let's talk about, um, uh, there's gonna be two things I wanna talk about. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you now so that I don't forget. Um, USTA versus UTR. And then I wanna talk about how a person who's a 3-5 can go to a 4-0 and a and a four zero to a four five. So let's yeah. let's go with US, USTA versus UTR. What's what's your position on that? So I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm not affiliated with either organization. I just want to put that out there. And I'm also not an expert. Like this isn't like a, a an area where I've done a lot of study or homework. But based on my experience uh, as a career coach and and having played a lot of tennis too it feels to me like there has to be a better solution than the ntrp approach the the usta approach um the fact that it's not very public um the fact that it's huge groups like from the bottom of three five to the top of three five is a huge range of levels and so when right. somebody says they're a three five it means a lot of different things based on whether you're a singles player or a doubles player or whether you play in Milwaukee or whether you play in Los Angeles or whether you play in Tampa. For, like, it can mean something completely, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, uh, it can mean something completely different. And so I think UTR, in, in essence, it was kind of their, their goal to kind of solve those problems. And again, like I'm, uh, and not a big expert in either like the nuts and bolts or like the, the back end of either rating system. But based on my surface level understanding, it appears to me like UTR is a much better solution. Um, it's ratings down to a hundredth of a, of a level. Right, right. Um, it's, it's public information. It's um, genders are together. And so, you know, uh, 6.25 guy and a 6.25 you know female are going to have a fantastic match uh, that's a big problem with uh with ntrp um and when you are a 6.25 in milwaukee in theory you're a great matchup against a 6.25 in houston texas uh that's also a big problem with ntrp uh depending on the geography and who you're playing in your local area you have a totally different not totally different but there can be significant, you know, deviation depending on geography. Right. So, uh, so UTR, see, I, again, I'm, I'm not like endorsing either one necessarily, and I'm not affiliated with either of them, but it looks to me like UTR is a better solution. If you, if you value accuracy, I feel like UTR is, is, appears to be the way to go. If you value plug and play and like ease of participation, then NTRP is still kind of just the standard rating system. Right. So it kind of depends on what you're looking to get out of it too. You know, and and uh, I played a match last night. We won our doubles match, and I went to my UTR ranking, and it, it went up in that quick. I mean, just from yeah. winning a match last night at eight o'clock when we entered the scores in at nine. When I looked this morning at five o'clock this morning, the ranking had already gone up. That's why I like UTR because it's more accurate and up to date. Whereas on USTA, uh, I'm a 3.5. And so the only way for me to move from 3.5 to a 4.0, uh, from what I understand from USTA, is from a year's of play, from a year long of playing before they're going to move me up. That's a long time. It is. And a lot can happen in that calendar year and good or bad uh, right good or bad yeah yeah in either direction and it's it's hard with ntrp it's hard to get a sense of cause and effect 
uh, it, when you have to wait a whole calendar year, it, it's very difficult to get a feel for um, based on who your partner was and who your opponents were and how close the match was and whether you won or lost and whether you're line one or line three. Like when you take a whole year's worth of experiences and there's just one move up or down, um, I think it can be really frustrating for players when they don't feel like they can optimize what they're doing or how they're doing it. It's, it's next to impossible when you take a whole 12 months of information and cram it all into one move up or down. All right, so let's move on from USTA, a person who's a 3-5 like me that wants to go to a 4-0 level. From just on the surface, in yeah. general, what do you see a person's problem is from 3-5 to hitting 4-0? Other yeah, than the fact good. that I hate to play singles. I like double <laughs> play. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to start where, where you started by saying, my answer is going to be very broad in general. There's a million ways to play tennis. There's a million ways to, to win a match. Some of them more on the conventional end of the spectrum and some of them very unique and personal. And so there's, there's more than one way that to skin a cat. That being said, it's, it's been my career, my entire life, helping people move to the next level. So I've seen a lot of general patterns. And I would say three, five to four zero. Oh, is somewhat of a magical jump in that you can be very, very successful at, at three, five and below. Two, five, three, oh, three, five. You can be extremely successful in a lot of matches by purely being consistent. It doesn't mean that you don't have any weapons or you, you never hit good shots or you never put the ball away, but simply by being consistent, you can be a very successful three, five player. And the jump from three, five to four, oh, usually means that you've started the process of developing some kind of reliable standout kind of weapon. And it might just be one shot. It might be a big serve. It might be a big forehand and doubles. It might be a big overhead that you're just like the go-to overhead putting away guy mm -hmm. or gal. Right. And so without any kind of attacking shot, that's kind of like the, the go-to like finishing shot, it's difficult to make the jump from 3-5 to 4-0 purely based on consistency. It's possible to be a 4-0 player based purely on consistency, but it has to be really exceptional. Like you, you have to be extremely uh, quick on your feet. You have to get to a lot of balls and you have to be coordinated and balanced and athletic enough to figure out how to put a lot of very difficult uh, balls back in play just however you can you can do it and based purely on consistency your your average tennis player doesn't have the special sauce enough to make it up to 4-0 just with that so you need at least one you know standout weapon i, I would say is kind of the the general theme that i see you know what I, what i've noticed where i play i play in um rosemary beach racket club in Panama city beach florida we play on clay courts and i play a lot with the four o's and i can hang easily with the four o's and some of these guys that are four o's i'm looking at the way they play and i'm thinking how in the world did you get a four o ranking you're not a four o dude you're like a three five and so I think that's another thing that I have a problem with, with again, with UC, USDA mm -hmm. is that the rankings are not consistent for the long, long term. So for a 4-0 to go to a 4-5, what does he typically, in general, need to do? So moving from 4-0 to 4-5, one standout weapon is no longer good enough. Uh, there has to start to be some kind of baseline foundation of just solid shot making all around. It's possible to be a four or five with a significant gap or weakness, but it means that everything else about your game has to be really significantly solid. Uh, so as an example, if you have a really poor backhand relative to the rest of your game at 4-0, there's a lot you can do to make up for it. Uh, in terms of footwork, in terms of positioning, in terms of optimizing for your forehand instead of your backhand, you know, as, a, as an example. 
Uh, or if you have like a really weak serve at, at 4-0, you can make up for it with speed or quickness. Or if your forehand and backhand are really solid and your serve's not great, you can still win a lot of matches at 4-0. When you get up to 4-5, or five, if you have any single really significant gap in your game, it becomes very difficult to win because most of who you're playing, you kind of go down the checklist, you know, uh, ground strokes, forehand, backhand, net game, overhead, first serve, second serve. Broadly speaking, when you kind of go down the checklist of general attributes that a tennis player would like to have, there's very few gaping holes at the four or five level. And so if, if you're a 4-0 player and you've been really successful at 4-0 and you have one or two really standout you know, attributes, you can win a lot of matches at 4-0. But if you have one or two standout detrimental parts of your game, then it's very hard to make the jump up to four or five because at that level, most of those competitors have a well-rounded enough game that A, they can pick out, they can like poke and, and kind of like prod and figure out where those gaps are. Mm -hmm. And then they also have a well-rounded enough game themselves to figure out how to exploit whatever that gap is. So it's no longer good enough to have like a standout attribute or two, like it is at 4.0. Now it's kind of like the inverse. Now the question is, do you have a big gap or two in your game? If you have one or two big gaps at, at, in your game in terms of your individual like shot making ability, then a, a good four or five player is gonna figure out how to just make you hit those gap shots and then just go to the well again and again and again. Right. And 3-0, three, 3-5, oh, three, 4 oh players just don't have that same ability or the well-rounded toolkit at those levels to sniff out those weaknesses and then just exploit them. Um, let's talk about doubles. Uh, do you sure. do a lot of coaching on doubles? Yeah, yeah, I love doubles. Okay. Uh, what about, um, I'm, I'm uh, the team captain for a women's doubles team. Um, and I noticed the first time they played last week, this is a three, five level women. None of them poach. And it was driving me crazy. I'm thinking these shots are going back and forth, back and forth. And nobody's poaching. And I'm yep. thinking, put away the shot, man. How do you feel about um, the doubles players that are scared to poach? Yeah, it's really a shame. And this is the way you're describing it is absolutely classic. It's across the board at I would say below 4-0 um, it's standard standard procedure and the the general culture around three five doubles and below the mindset the mantra at those levels are cover your side of the court sure as heck don't get burned down your alley and right. if you're going to come onto my side of the court you better put the ball away 99 <laughs> times out of 100 because if you don't <laughs> I'm going to give you the stink eye for, for like the rest of the match because you dared to s set foot over on my side of the court to try to take my ball. Right. right. So there's like very much uh, like the mindset at those levels is very much your side and my side. And when you analyze points of elite doubles players, there are no sides. Like the, the, the center service line might as well not exist. When you look at low level players, they'll literally like come up to the center line and be like, like it looks like they're coming up to the edge of a cliff. Right. Like, whoa, right. whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, like I, it's I, quicksand I can't. or something. Yeah. Like there, there's like a force field, like keeping them from crossing that center line because they know if they cross it and they don't win the point, they're going to catch hell from their partner. <laughs> and so um, that's just an unfortunate, for whatever reason, that, that permeates. Every part of the, the country I've been in, like that's just kind of a universal cultural dynamic in lower to intermediate, you know, level doubles. And when you watch high level doubles, it's the exact opposite. Oh yeah, uh, high yeah, sure. Well, high level doubles, when somebody poaches and and frames the ball into the net, the partner is only encouraging. They're they're like, yeah, yeah, good good move, good move, go for it. Like that's your ball. And it's the opposite at low levels. So like my suggestion to you, Rob, would be like, be the, be the catalyst to create a culture in like a, a, a language around that team where 
it's not only acceptable to cross the center line, but it's encouraged and actually like that's the, the best thing you can do to help out your partner and by extension help out your team is by being pro proactive up there. I really think they're scared to poach. Oh yeah, it's because they're scared of the re repercussions. They're scared of getting chewed out by the partner. And so I think the, the understanding and the mindset and the culture around the team has to shift before any individual players feel empowered to actually go and, and get the ball on the other side. Me and my wife play mixed doubles. And the first time we played in a tournament, we got hammered. I mean, like, I just wanted to put a hood over my hand. We got beat so <laughs> bad. And the reason we got beat is because the guy was poaching on everything. I couldn't get around him. And so after that, I told Bethany, I said, Bethany, we have to start poaching. The only way we're going to win in mixed doubles is to poach. So now I tell her to hog the net. And that's that's our terminology. Hog right. the whole net. This this area is yours. Take it. Because she's really good at the net. She's better at the net than I am. Um, Love it. So, and then you're right. What she said, seeing pros, it is a whole new ball game, like the Bryan brothers and watching yep. them play. Um, but it's, it's kind of funny how the difference is between men's doubles, women's doubles, and then mixed doubles. Let me, uh, let me draw you a quick, uh, I, I got this from, do you know who Craig O'Shaughnessy is? I don't. He's a, te a tennis analyst and um, I, I just have to give him credit for this because I, I thought this was so smart. Um, I saw him uh, speaking at a conference and um, he explained this so incredibly well. Uh, he said, most players view their side of the doubles court like this, where there's this like line in the middle and, and this is your side and this is my side. Right. And he said, the line really looks something like uh, this, where it goes across diagonally and the net player is responsible for all of this and the baseline player Oh, sorry, I wasn't ready here. The baseline player is responsible for this. And so rather than have this big um, uh, separation point in the middle, really like this net player should feel totally empowered. Like this is all their space. Like this is their zone. Uh, but the way most players play it, they're like, this is my zone. <laughs> and, and they're only comfortable like navigating that part of the court, which, which makes winning so, so difficult. That's crazy. And so we, um, we, um, we take lessons from a guy and, and he teaches to follow your partner when you're going across from side mm -hmm. to side. And that was a big, that was something big for me to learn how to do because don't really have a whole lot of experience playing doubles. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is the differences between um, a level of tennis based on where you live. For example, um, if you make it to sectionals in Florida, like we're in North Florida, and you make it to sectionals, you're going to go to Orlando. And a 4-0 in Orlando is not really a 4-0. I think he's a sandbagger. He's more like a 4-5-5-0. How do you feel about that area there, where they're not really what they should be but yet they're making it to sectionals based on their performance. So I guess I would, I would just simply say that it's not the Orlando 4-0's fault. The way that the ratings work is it's all, it's a relative scale based on the people that you compete against. In other words, the people who play tennis here in Milwaukee play tennis against other people in Milwaukee. And so the whole deck is shuffled around based on the wins and the losses relative to the other people that you play against. And so when somebody plays five years of tennis here in Milwaukee and then they make their way up to a 3.5 uh, level, that's fantastic. That means that they can beat easily, you know, in theory on paper, all the 3-0 players here in Milwaukee and they're gonna lose the vast majority of the time to the 4-0 players here in Milwaukee. The problem is this whole system is not relative to everybody else in the country 
or even relative to everybody else in the world, it's only relative to the people that you compete against day in and day out. And so that's why when you're a 4-0 player and you go to another state or even another city, if you're in a, a state like Florida where, so, where tons of people play tennis, even city to city, there's going to be big differences between a 4-0 in one area and a 4-0 in another area because it's 4-0 rel relative to the other players in your immediate space. If you don't go compete in Orlando, then your rating isn't based on Orlando's players. Your rating is based on Tampa's players or where, yeah. whatever city you happen to live in. So it's not that the, the guy in Orlando is sandbagging. It's that his level of competition in Orlando is higher than the level of competition wherever you, you happen to live. Right. And so it's not his fault. It's the this, it's this system's you know, fault. It's not inclusive enough to take into account all the other people. It's just relative to the people you're playing right in your geographical area. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. All right, so one last question for you. Hypothetical situation. I love questions, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, you've been given the power to make one change in tennis. Whatever you want it to be whether it's the game of tennis, rules of tennis, anything you want, but you only can change one thing about the game of tennis. What is it going to be? Does it have to be practical, like have to actually make sense in real life or it can literally- These are your yeah. rules, dude. You get to decide. <laughs> so ec economically, this doesn't work, but I mean, the first thing that comes to mind for me is it would just be free. It'd be free for everybody. It'd be free to play. It'd be free to compete. It'd be free to receive instruction and receive the guidance and the, you know, the tools that you need to enjoy the game, to develop the, the skills that you want to develop so that it's, it's fulfilling and enjoyable and, and fun, you know, for the individual. I think that Lots of people love tennis, but there's a perception of tennis that's kind of uh, an elitist, you know, kind of game. Um, it's a lot it's, cheaper than golf. I, it's funny. I was just going to say it has strong connections to like a country club, you know, kind of environment. Um, and I think that that doesn't really serve the game in terms of growing it in a grassroots kind of uh, kind. Of, yes, it's dramatically cheaper. It takes less time than uh, than golf. But relative to, let's say, soccer, you know, the kind of the universal sporting language right. of most of the world, uh, what do you need, you know, to play soccer? You, you need the ball and that's it. You don't even need to be in like a field. Um, I've traveled around enough to see people play soccer in all kinds of different uh, environments and venues and amounts of space. And tennis just isn't that accessible. So if it didn't cost $50,000 to build a court, and it didn't cost $100 to take a lesson, uh, and it didn't cost whatever, $100 to join a league and play a league, then I think the this, this sport would dramatically grow. Unfortunately, if we, if we play that out, you know, somebody has to pay for those things. Right. And so it's a, a pie in the sky you know, kind of answer. It doesn't really work in real life, but if I could snap my fingers and make anything possible, then I would just say it would be free. So I guess uh, me asking you for a couple of million to build indoor courts in North Florida is out of the question then, right? Is that what you're telling me? Man, you got, you, you've got Florida weather and you're, you're gonna <laughs> ask for, a, for indoor see, courts. The problem, is, the problem is when it <laughs> rains, you can't go to the beach, so there's nothing to do. You can't play tennis. You I got mean, clay courts? If it's sprinkling, if it's sprinkling it's you can play on clay courts, but that's about yeah. it. Yeah. All right, so if, for me, I, you didn't ask me this question, but I'll just tell you, if I could make one change, I would get rid of the second serve. Hmm. One serve. That's what I would do. That so would, you're you're answering the question from uh, a fan of like the professional game, uh, not not so much uh, the whole uh, game. How would that help amateur you know players like like us? Because you got to get your first serve in instead of depending on your second serve. Get your serve in and start working on your ground strokes instead of trying to ace on the first serve. And then using a kick serve on the second serve, just get the first serve and then let's play ball. That's what I would do. 
or are you using the old uh, frying pan, you know, patty cake, uh, second serve, <laughs> like so many players do. Yeah, I would, I would help a lot of players. Yeah. Well, Ian, thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to post this video on YouTube. I'm also going to post it on your group because you've got such a huge fan base. Um, if I was there, I would get your autograph because I've been watching you for years. <laughs> but thank you for oh, well, your time. For yeah, of course. Thank you for your, your passion and, and your enthusiasm for the game and for your passion and enthusiasm for making videos and doing podcasts. And that's incredible. You're, you're a man after my own heart. So thanks for spreading the, the good news of the game. I, I appreciate it a lot. All right. Thank you very much.